Let me just pray for a moment. Lord, thank you for this day. And I pray for there to be open hearts and open minds, open spirits today as we interact. Amen. I, uh, so, it, you know, normally we don't have a, you know, we don't have a subject. Like we just preach. In other words, nobody gives us a subject. But I've known for a couple of three or four months that I was going to do first Sunday. Bill's going to do next Sunday on the on this building project. And so I spent a good part of the, the day yesterday just preparing and did all these notes and around Nehemiah and building the building and on courage. Then I, I said to the Lord when I went to bed last night, you know, if you have anything, <laughs> around the subject, you know, feel free to, you know, interject it. And uh, this morning, <laughs> I mean, I thought I was like doing his thing, but you know, I'm, I mean, I've preached a message that wasn't anointed before, and I know where that goes. So I'm, I'm always trying to like, okay, Lord, if you have something that you want to share. And this morning I had a, a dream about five o'clock this morning. Uh, and uh, I'll re- I, was in, I was repairing, I was in like this in my house or someplace, and I was repairing this pillar. And in the dream, there was someone bringing me like building materials for repairing this pillar. And it was, it was light in the house and it was light outside. It was daytime. But when they came to uh, back the trailer in that had materials to repair the pillar, instead of backing up on, on my, in my driveway, he backed up over my lawn. And when I looked out to say something to him, it was dark. I mean, it was daytime, but it was dark. And he backed over my lawn and he was breaking all my sprinklers. And I ran out and I said to him, what are, you, what are you doing? <laughs> Why didn't you back up on the driveway? And he said, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. And I, when I woke up, I realized that I was rebuilding the pillar of justice. And some people who were coming to help didn't realize that we, they, they didn't realize that they were off the highway and they were actually doing more destruction than they were good. And I want to talk a little bit about um, this whole idea of a pillar and this pillar of justice. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself and just give away uh, some of what happened. In 2004, I had a, a day encounter with the Lord. I was awake. I was fully awake. I wasn't, I wasn't dreaming. I didn't have a vision. But I heard the Lord say to me, very, like, almost audibly, I'm going to give you the seven pillars of society, and I want you to write them down. And I literally ran in the kitchen, grabbed a pen, went back, got my notebook, and I wrote down seven pillars of society, of which the first one was justice. I'll tell you about them in a few minutes. But I wrote them down, and I I think the first time I shared them, which was about a week or so later, was with a prayer meeting with leaders, and I shared that, and with each pillar of, that the Lord gave me seven pillars of justice, no, seven pillars, one of them was justice, uh, he gave me a little saying with them. When I came to the leaders meeting that morning, and read them, one of the leaders said, hey, did you read this proverb? 9-1 says, wisdom has built her house and she has hewed out seven pillars. And I, I know Proverbs, I'm sure I read that verse before, but I did not, that verse was not the inspiration for seven pillars. I never even remember that verse was there. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what I actually think we're building this morning, I was reading Genesis chapter 28, 10. You're, you're probably familiar with it. Let me read it to you. Now, Jacob departed from Bathsheba and went towards Haram. He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it under his head and lay down at that place. He had a dream and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth with its top reaching the heaven. And behold, the angel of the Lord was descending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The land in which you lie, I will give it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and you and your descendants shall be, oh, I'm sorry, in you, in you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, 
and will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, and I will, get, and I will, not, leave you, I will not leave you until I have done all that I promised you. Then Jacob woke up from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took a stone and he put it that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar. Everybody say a pillar. And he poured oil on its top and he called the name of the place Bethel or Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz or L-U-E-Z, however you pronounce that, Luz. Luz means almonds. I, I would assume that the city was named after the agriculture that was there, probably almonds. And so they called the name of that city almonds. But Jacob has an encounter with the Lord, which we just read. He didn't know the Lord was there. He lays his head on the rock. He falls asleep and he has this dream of angels ascending and descending. I'm sure you've read this before. You've certainly have heard it preached from here before. And his encounter with the Lord actually changes the DNA of that city. <laughs> so that no longer is that city famous for almonds, but it is actually a gate of heaven, right? It's the, it's the house of God, the gate of heaven. In other words, that city becomes famous for encounters, not for almonds. I'm saying his, in his encounter with the Lord literally changed the actual the DNA of that place. And what's interesting to me is he sets up a pillar, not an altar, a pillar. Are you with me? Later, that pillar is also called an altar. Follow me. Sometimes in scripture, Jacob's rock that he set up is called an altar, and sometimes it's called a pillar. Are you following me? And I'm saying that his altar became a pillar. What's a pillar? A pillar is a plumb line. A, pi a pillar is a plumb line that creates a sense of justice in a city. Follow me. I'm saying your encounter with God, your, your altar with God changes the DNA of the city and brings a pillar in the city which creates justice, which creates righteousness in the city. Are you following me? Okay, let me give you a, an example. Um, I just read to you that wisdom has built her house and, and has hewed out seven pillars. In the book of Revelation 3.12, Jesus is, speaks to his church and he says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of God. How many know when you overcome, you become a pillar. You, you're not just an altar, you're not just a place of encounter, but you're actually a place, place of strength and direction. You are become a plumb line for a community. You become a pillar when you overcome. Are you with me? I'm gonna read you a couple of verses in just a minute, but I wanna uh, tell you about an experience I had this is a few months ago. I was, uh, we have a little farm in Shingletown. And uh, if you've ever been to Shingletown, it's, uh, it's, it's just a little narrow, it's not super narrow, but it's a two lane road all the way to Shingletown. And the only thing, traffic is passing you, you know, it's just two lanes. You're going, I think the, the speed limit's like 65. So you're passing people head on. And the only thing keeping you from hitting one another is this, you'll, this double yellow line. And I was, driving and it was, there was a lot of traffic that day. And I was thinking, you know what? This four inch yellow line play not, play, painted on the ground is the only thing separating us. And I, I had this thought and I pull over and recorded it. And let me read it to you. I'm driving along realizing that we have social agreements with each other to keep one another safe. I'm driving on a two lane highway, passing cars coming at me at 60 miles an hour with only a four inch yellow line painted on the ground separating us. The oncoming drivers have an agreement to stay in their lane and I have an agreement to stay in my lane as we pass each other. The unspoken agreement isn't morally right or wrong outside the context, but the context of our speed and the risk of each other passing us head on makes our social agreement paramount. I may not agree to the speed limit, but if I don't agree to drive on the right side of the road, or in Paul's case, the left, it could be fatal, it could be, uh, it could be fatal very quickly for me and or my fellow drivers. This, these moral contracts are often referred to as laws, and without them, the world would be a chaotic, massive death trap. The government is commissioned by God to create and enforce laws for the sake of peace and safety. 
Can you imagine if 30% of all drivers on the road were allowed to opt out of these agreements, but still allowed to drive on the same roads? Or what if, we, it, what if we voted on what side of the road we wanted to drive on and the right side won by popular vote, yet everyone who voted for the left side decided that they would drive on the side of the road they preferred? I, I don't know if you're getting where I'm going. In Judges 17, 6, it says, in those days there was no king in Israel and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Did you get that? Let me read it again. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. I'm pointing out that plumb lines create cultural values, and those cultural values create laws. Are you with me? And those laws create safety. And the ultimate plumb line is the plumb line of justice. And how many know when Jesus died on the cross, he created justice? He created, he, he created justice so that he cleansed people from their sins and from the repercussions of their sin. He changed the plumb line so that instead of being punished for your sin, are you with me? He set up a pillar, are you with me? He set up a pillar and that pillar said, listen, the plumb line is if you receive me, you don't have to pay for your sin and no longer are we policing sin, but we are promoting righteousness. What I'm getting at is that we live in a culture that is, is actually based on sinners. When the police officer pulls me over, he's not pulling me over because I've done a good job driving. He doesn't pull me over. He's like, man, that driving. I've been watching you leave your house. It is amazing. And, we, and we've been handing out these rewards for driving. No, I'm saying if an officer pulls you over, he is policing under the condition that you are sinning, that you are breaking the law. Are you with me? And I'm saying what happens when, when we become a plumb line, when our encounter with God becomes an altar and that altar becomes a plumb line and that plumb line redefines the soil that we live in and the city that we're a part of is we begin to have righteousness be the plumb line and suddenly we change the culture and, and we share what we let people know that God's not looking for what you did wrong. He's actually come and his reward is with him. <laughs> Are you following me? Okay, better than your res response. Paul Manwaring gave me these two scriptures between first and second service. Uh, I want to read Zechariah chapter three, verse eight. Now listen, Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you. Indeed, these men are a symbol. For behold, I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring in my servant the branch. For, for, for behold, I'm going to bring in my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have set up before Joshua. Everybody say stone. Here we go. We got another pillar. On one stone are seven eyes. And behold, I will engrave on the inscription I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord. I will remove your iniquity from that land in one day. And in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine tree and under his fig tree. Let me read it to you again. On that stone, on that stone, let's see, it says before, I was on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord, and I will remove the... Here's the inscription. I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under this fig tree and under his vine. How many understand that he set up a stone? The stone had seven eyes. He set up a pillar and that pillar had seven eyes and that pillar had an inscription and that pillar said, in one day, I'll take away all your iniquity. How many know the stone's Christ, right? He set up the stone. <laughs> that stone had seven eyes. We'll talk about that in a minute. And that stone took away our iniquity. It changed our poor value. It changed the lines. Are you following me? Uh, Zechariah 4, 1 through 10. Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was wakened from his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see, behold, a lampstand all of gold with its bowl on the top of it and it's seven lamps on it, and seven sprouts belong to each of the lamps which are on top of it. Also two olive trees are by it, one on the right of the side of the bowl, one on its left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me, what, are, what does this mean? And the angel said to, he, to him who's speaking with me, said, you don't know what, these mean, what this means? He said, nope. 
Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace. And also the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel that have laid his foundations of this house, have laid the foundations of this house, his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. For who has despised the day of small beginnings? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the land of Zerubbabel. <laughs> These are the eyes of the Lord, which, which range to and fro throughout the earth. Uh, he says, the stone has eyes. And these stone, then this, then the eyes of the stone, they're looking. Later on, he says, he's looking for people he can strongly support. Are you with me? And he said, that stone is creating a plumb line. Are you following me? And I'm pointing out that the Lord is creating a plumb line and what, what's happening is we aren't just building a building, we are increasing our capacity. Why are we increasing our capacity? Because as the world gets, as the world moves way away from justice, as the world moves deeper, deeper into the cesspool, they can't figure out what gender they are. They can't figure out in the name of love, in the name of love, we gotta love everybody. They have confused love. They have driven through on the lawn. They have broken their sprinklers. They have passed the double line in the name of love. And God is saying, I'm raising up a plumb line. It's coming from the altar. It's becoming, are you with me? It's becoming a pillar. It's coming from the altar. From your relationship with me, I'm gonna build an altar that's becoming a, a pillar, which is becoming a plumb line, which is shifting the nations because the Lord is changing justice through his blood. Yeah. And I'm saying that we are not just building a building, we are increasing the capacity of this movement to seep into the nations, this pillar standing in the middle, the eyes of the Lord on this pillar, changing the history of America and the world. And we have to increase our capacity because the deep darkness requires a bigger light. Right. Now you're getting it. I, I had this encounter, I told you about it just a few minutes ago, January 21st, um, and the Lord told me to write down these seven pillars. So I'm, I'm just gonna read them to you. I'm not gonna teach on them, but I'm gonna give you the seven pillars that he shared with me. The first one he shared with me was justice. And, he's, and I, he gave me a little phrase with each one of them, which I will read. The law is the facilitator of justice. The law has, only has a purpose in bringing about justice. Uh, I'm sorry, the law only has a purpose in bringing about and sustaining justice. When a society loses the foundation of justice, the law begins to serve itself and it starts taking on a life of its own. This creates a culture where peace officers become law enforcement officers and justice courts become magistrates of the law. Judges and juries are now charged, are now charged with determining whether someone broke the law rather than if they performed an injustice. Proverbs 29.4 says, the king brings stability to the land by justice. Next one, the next pillar, number two, is peace. And the Lord said to me, peace is the foundation of government. The purpose of all government is to facilitate peace. When peace is removed from government, government begins to serve itself. The goal of its officials becomes staying in power instead of extending the borders of peace. Isaiah chapter nine, verse seven says, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. The third pillar, which you would have thought was the first one, is love. Love is the purpose of fatherhood. Fathers are the facilitators of love. When love is lost, fathers become bosses and the, his family becomes his subjects. Caring and compassion are replaced by sexual perversion and abandonment. Happiness is no longer the fruit of a loving relationship, but instead it becomes the purpose of them. I'm not happy becomes the reason for their actions. Romans 13, 10 says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. The fourth one is honor. Honor is the element in society that allows people to be empowered rather than controlled. Honor is the responsibility of sons and daughters. They exemplify respect that results in order. When honor is served instead of serving, it causes leaders to demand honor, even though it's incongruent with their character. 
This results in a culture of control that is manifest through fear. I think it's number five. Truth, truth is the, uh, was the fifth pillar. Truth is more than honesty. It's the embodiment, embodiment of reality. The fruit of truth is life. The word of God is the facilitator of truth. Bible, I'm sorry, teachers are the stewards of truth. When truth is absent from a culture, the Bible begins to be served instead of serving. This consequently leads to people learning, but never coming to the knowledge resulting, I'm sorry, knowledge of the truth, resulting in rules of religion being exchanged for the reality of relationship. Proverbs 29, 14 says, if a king judges the poor in truth, his throne will be established forever. The sixth one is righteousness. Righteousness is more than the accumulation of good character choices. Righteousness is the visible expression of a habitation of an invisible yet holy God. Righteousness is the personification, the very nature of God, being manifest through his cre cre creatures, resulting in his likeness emulating through his people. When divinity is absent from a culture, good, godliness is, re is reduced to goodness, which is obtained through discipline instead of a pure heart. Proverbs 20, verse 28 says, Loyalty and truth preserve the king, and he upholds his throne in righteousness. Uh, wisdom, is this number seven? Yes. Wisdom is the ability to rightly apply knowledge in a way that builds for the future what is envisioned by the creator so that the divine ecosystem of heaven yields life. Rulers are the stewards of wisdom. They are to lead in a way that creates an environment that draws out and facilitates the destiny of people both individually and corporately. When the definition of wisdom is reduced to gathering and recalling information, it results in fertility. That's Proverbs uh, 3.13 says, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding he, he uh, established the heavens. Um, I, I just wanna say that I believe that the Lord is establishing the pillar of justice. I believe he's establishing all seven pillars, but I believe that he's establishing the pillar of justice. I believe, I, I love what, Zach, uh, what it says in, in, in Zechariah, who despises the day of small beginnings? The Lord is establishing the pillar of justice. Jesus put it like this, Matthew 12, 20, a battered reed God will not break off, a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. The question becomes, how do we bring this pillar of justice into a community? And I wanna say for myself that I feel like my language in the early days of this movement, I wish I had spoken differently because I don't like the language of invasion. We're gonna invade the seven mountains. We're gonna take the world. I feel like that, we're gonna be, that we are gonna be moving through invitation and not through invasion that literally the nations are going to come to us, we're not going to go to them necessarily. I, I don't, it's probably both, but Isaiah 60 says, and uh, the, your, your gates will be open continually, they will not be closed day or night, so that the wealth of nations may come to you, the kings leading their procession. I'm saying God's gonna establish justice, justice is gonna create peace, it's gonna create joy, are you with me? It's gonna create happiness, people are gonna, the world's gonna go, how do you do that? And they're gonna be coming, they're gonna be coming and going, how do you get your kids to behave like that? Can you help me with my kid who doesn't know what gender he is? Can you help me with this problem over here? And I'm saying the wisdom from another age is gonna be flowing through the justice of the Lord who doesn't put out even a little burning wick because I believe the world is looking for love, yes, in the wrong places, but they are trying to protect people by love and they have lost the sense of justice they're crossing the double line, not realizing that what they actually want, they're actually creating the opposite and creating death. When God goes, I see that there's a burning wick in there. I see it's just flickering. I see you're looking for love. I see you're trying to protect these people in the name of, hey, they should be protected. And God's like, I like that, but you need justice on the cross. So you can be released from your sin because the eyes of the Lord are looking this is a good word right here. I love, so the question is like, how do these pillars get set up? I love this. Acts 17, 16, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his friends, his spirit was being provoked within him as he observed the city full of idols. 
Now, I wanna say this, exposing ourselves to evil should provoke us to action. Paul sees the idols and he's provoked. I wanna show you that he's not provoked to anger, he's provoked to compassion. Are you with me? He sees the idols, he's pro provoked to compassion, and he, in verse 23 says this, says this, now he's going to speak to them. He's provoked out of, out of his compassion, he sees all the idols, and he begins to say, I gotta do something. A lot of people are just provoked to anger. They're provoked to depression. They're, they're provoked to, I'm moving out of California. We don't need to move out, we need to move in. We need to move deeper into the beast. We need, this is our, country, this is our land, this is our promised land. I don't know. I don't know, I get tired of Christians. I'm leaving because of our world, they're so evil. I'm like, good luck finding place that isn't. I want to go to a church where the leaders are perfect, where the people are perfect. Like, as soon as you get there, it won't be. It'll have a critical spirit once you get there. So Paul begins to preach. The, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> it was good. Acts chapter, seven, Acts chapter 17, verse 24. He begins, to, he begins to preach them. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people like life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. I like this, by the way. This could preach the boundaries of their habitation. God has actually given you boundaries for your habitation. There is a place that you can call your land. Let's move on. That they would seek God if perhaps he might grope for them, they might grope for him and, he, and find him, though he's not far from each of us. For in him we live, move, and exist, even as some of your poets have said, quote, for we also are his children. I love this because Paul says, listen, guys, I saw your, I saw your, in, your altar to the unknown God. That unknown God, I know him. <laughs> he connects with a place. He goes, you guys have an altar set up the unknown God. He doesn't offend them. He goes, the God, listen, I saw your other idols. And that one right there, this one, the unknown God, I know that one. He's the creator and he begins to connect with them on their level and say, the God you're looking for, I know. He's the creator. And then he connects with, his, with one of their most famous poets and he goes, yeah, your poet, he wrote, we are all children of God. He was right about that. I'm saying he, he quotes the Justin Bieber, the Taylor Swift, he quotes the Madonna of their day. He goes, hey, what she said, what he said, yeah, that's actually the Lord. We are all children of God. And instead of coming in with, you guys are sitting, you're, you got idols there, he steps in to Greek culture and he goes, hey, that unknown God, would you like to know about him? And he brings justice. He's building a pillar in the middle of that, not through invasion, not through intrusion, but through invitation. And he begins to talk to them about the God that their poets are speaking about even though they don't know the God they're speaking about. I love this. This morning as I was preparing, uh, I, I, I found this note that I had taken way back in 2005. And uh, it said, um, it's, it was written on December 25th, so it was written on Christmas of 2005. And I'll just read it to you. Yesterday, Benny's picture was on the front page of the record Searchlight. Oops, didn't know that was gonna happen. Hasn't happened the other two times. That probably happens to you too, right? Because she was dedicating the Sundial Bridge, which is a glass bridge. This is, the, this, is a, this is the prophetic statement of the year. God is building an invisible bridge between the church and the city. The world will be able to see the river beneath us 
and they will cross over with joy and we will welcome them. They are the ones building the bridge. Profound. Benny Johnson is dedicating the bridge and the newspaper is covering it. It's a glass bridge. It's the sundial bridge. The sun dial. Did you get it? The sun, S-O-N, S-U-N, Malachi says the sun, S-U-N, will rise. It's the sun dial. It's the pillar. Uh, anyway, you gotta, you, you gotta be a little weird to get this. It's a glass bridge built by people who maybe they don't know the Lord, I don't know, but it's a prophetic declaration and she, our chief intercessor, is dedicating the sun dial bridge, a glass bridge where you can see the river through it. The Sacramento River. Oh wait, I, I, this could get deeper. The Sacramento River. I'm point, oh, okay, I, you know, I'm, I know where this is going. I, now I see four minutes up there and I got something else to say. A, a few years ago, I was asked to write an ins inspirational um, article for our building project. It was probably like six or seven years ago. And uh, every, everyone, how many of you have ever written anything, you've authored something or written articles, raise your hand. Well, you, you'll connect with this. I, I, I had a deadline, which always is very helpful. And I was trying to write this inspirational article and it was like, I was like looking at the paper till like drops of blood fell off my head. I'm exaggerating to make a point. And I'd write down, I wrote a bunch of stuff and then I, I read it to myself. I'm like, that's terrible. That's terrible. And I just spent hours writing and rewriting things that were terrible. I'd take a little break, go get something to eat, come back and read it and go, oh, that's terrible. And I felt the Lord say, do you want some help? <laughs> the same response for sure. Do you want some? I'm, I'm like, I, I never know why I don't just think about, like, maybe I should ask for help before I stare at the paper. And so I'm like, yeah, that, oh yeah, that would, that would be great. And so I wrote this. Now, you've probably heard this. I've probably read it, I don't know, 30, 40 times. But I feel like it's anointed and that it came out of something the Lord gave me. And I feel like it's really anointed for it right now, right word and right season. So I'm gonna read it one more time. Sorry if you've heard it already. In the oracles of history, there are always a few exceptional individuals who by virtue or by new birth push the envelope of human expectation and shape the destiny of nations. Often born into adverse conditions and in the midst of perilous times, these revivalists refuse to be reduced to their circumstances. Instead, they somehow find the capacity of soul to rise in dark times and courageously shift society towards wholeness. The first great awakening was instigated by two of these radicals who dared to defy the religious protocols of their day and instead moved in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield's ministries literally shifted the course of history. Yet a large part of what fueled the great awakening was William Tennant's Log College, which was often referred to by Whitfield as the School of the Prophets. Established, founded in 1726 in a small cabin in the backwoods community of a backwoods community of Pennsylvania, and in contrast to the great stone universities of England, <laughs> the Log College graduated only 13 students its first year. But what's often overlooked is that all 13 of the original Log College graduates became pioneers in Christian education in America. And although the Log College would graduate fewer than 100 students in its short history, 51 colleges stem from this little school, including the famous Princeton University. The Log College became a sort of Bethlehem, giving birth to revivalists who dared to believe that they could change the world. The renowned professors of William Tennant's day ridiculed the Log College, yet little did they know 
in that insignificant community, Tennant was training up and equipping world changers. Is it possible that history is repeating itself in our own obscure community? Could it be that this move of God birthed in a small mountain community of Weaverville is called, is called by God to alter the course of nations? It just might be that we are in the midst of the third great awakening, that the 15,000 reformers who have come here from more than 80 nations to be trained and equipped are just the beginning of the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah's vision of kings coming to the brightness of their rising. We are obligated by the sheer number of souls migrating here to be equipped for greatness, to ready ourselves for growth. We must prepare our facility, enlarge our capacity, and deepen our resolve. We are not here to erect a monument to the glory of God. We are feeling a movement, forging a legacy, and hosting his presence. Like Antioch in the first century, we are preparing an apostolic center to mold future revivalists who will reach into the darkest corners of the planet with the good news of the kingdom of God and the gospel of the kingdom. With all this in mind, we must rise and build. Build a house for the mighty. Build a people who are equipped to restore ruined cities. Build a launching site for the generations to come. Build a community that models on earth as it is in heaven. Please join us in this epic endeavor to transform the world till the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God. You know, this is an um, exciting time. I, I, I want to echo something Dan said already. But um, we, uh, many years ago, around 17 or 18 years ago, we started getting prophecies that we were going to start a college. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Bill and I have never graduated from anything except for high school. <laughs> I would say God uses the foolish things of the world, but I, I won't say that because I just said Bill and I make sure I stay here. But we started getting these prophetic words about having a university, a college, and that we would actually shift the educational system towards the knowledge and the glory of God. And two weeks ago, we got accredited and we are officially Bethel College. Oh yeah. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. And the people who came here to um, do the research to, to potentially accredit us, they had been to 43 other campuses over their time of accreditation. I don't know if that's, I guess probably several years. And they made this statement to our team. This is the best team We've ever, we've ever done research for accreditation. The best team. The application was 400 pages long. It took a year to fill out the application. Yes, so this wasn't a little thing. Then they had to fly to Florida to get accredited and sit in a council where they asked them more questions. They were in and out in 15 minutes. I just want you to know what our teams are doing. Like, this is the beginning of something huge. And some of them are like, you need a building. I'm like, no, no, no. We need to grow our capacity because we are bringing a pillar. We're going to set a pillar in the middle of the educational world. We're going to set a pillar in the middle of the political world. We're going to set a pillar in the middle of the arts. <laughs> We're going to set a pillar in the middle of the music and worship world. We're going to set up, I don't know if you're going where I'm going. We're going to set a pillar in the middle of the family. We're going to begin to set pillars all over the place, and we have to expand our capacity because we are in the days of small beginnings, but we are not staying small. We are building for the generations to come, and that, begin, that building is just people are like, you're building a big building. Well, for you and Bill, Mike, for Bill and I, no, no, we'll, we'll, listen, our, we'll be on the sidelines cheering the next generation on as they begin to blow the world up with the kingdom of God. Turn the world upside down is actually biblical. That's what I got to say. Now, we're, 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 all of this is to climax next week. Like we really want to take a huge offering next week. And you saw that we're, we're 60 million, 67 million short or 60 million short. If you'd like to write a check right now, we'll just stop the campaign. That'll be awesome. And we'll start another one two weeks from now for the next building that we're building. 
No, but what we want to give you an opportunity next week to actually spend time with the Lord this week. Think about what you should do. Kathy and I gave a quarter million to the project. We committed that much and we'll probably commit more. So I just want you to know that we're not asking you to do something that our family isn't doing. But it's not equal giving, it's equal sacrifice. Are you with me? If you can give $5, that's great. If you can give $5 million, that's great. If you can give $500 million, that's really great. We love that too. <laughs> Got to start thinking about billions. We think the wealth of nations are coming. You're watching us on Bethel TV. You're part of our family. We also want to give this invitation to you. But I, I, I just felt like we should take an offering today. Um, so if you, if, we're going to give you an opportunity to give today. If you're going to be here next week on a serious note, that's great. That's going to be the big climax of it all. Um, but you can give online right there. If you need an envelope, you, we can bring you an envelope right now. Ushers, just raise your hand if you need an envelope. Because uh, seriously, some of you won't be here. If you're looking online, you can see the QR code online. You can go right there. You can go to Bethel.com also and look up building. And, and you can go right to the building. Anybody need? Cool. I'm just going to pray right now and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you about what to do. Um, if you get a number and your spouse gets a number, add those two together. <laughs> Lord, I just, I thank you for that you're expanding our capacity to bring justice to the nations and to shift the course of human history. And I thank you that you have an ever growing, ever increasing government that brings peace. I pray, God, for my friends and this wonderful family that's located all over the world. Lord, I thank you that they've participated in such a gracious way, generous way already. But Lord, I pray that you take us to the finish line. We started a race that we need to finish. We started a fight we need to win. And so I bless these, your people, and I pray, God, for a windfall in the next seven days that we could actually finish this building debt-free as the prophets have been prophesying. And Lord, I pray for everyone who commits and doesn't commit even that you would accelerate and expand their capacity for wealth. In Jesus' name, amen.